gonna give you 50 data science concepts and explain them all in just a few minutes and I'm gonna assume no prior knowledge of data science whatsoever. And knowing these things can help you stand out during a job interview or just help you perform better in your role and therefore be promoted. We'll cover concepts from all aspects of data science and I guarantee that there will be terms that you've never even heard about even if you have some experience in the field. Let's begin training your neural net. When working with data, you need a few basic skills to be able to deal with it. This is called data literacy and it's basically the ability to read, understand, create and communicate data as information. Now, once you have some data, you can apply statistical methods to analyze this data, for example, using the mean, median mode to understand the results of a customer satisfaction survey. This is called statistical analysis. A good way to both present and understand data is to do it graphically through data visualizations. For example, using a pie chart to display sales across different regions and compare what regions are responsible for the most sales. To work with databases, we need a language to query the data. That's why we use SQL or structured query language to, for example, extract a list of our customers from our customer table in our relational database. To be able to use the data, we of course need to collect it first. But the second and really important step is called data cleaning, where we remove errors and fix inconsistencies in the data. If we have bad data, this can skew our results, which can be very harmful for our analysis and lead to bad decision making. Most of our data is there in a raw format and it's not really usable, but with the help of data wrangling, we can turn it into a usable format. For example, we might have different spreadsheets with data all over the place that we turn into a structured system in our database. To understand datasets, we need to explore them, because we don't always know what they're trying to tell us right away. To achieve this, we can use different analytical techniques, and this is a part of EDA, which stands for Exploratory Data Analysis. We could, for example, use a histogram to explore the distribution of a variable. Now, what about business intelligence? Well, it is a field where we specifically use data to inform and improve business decisions. We may want to analyze customers and their buying behaviors so that we can improve our marketing and make more sales by making specific promotions and time them properly. Now, let's talk about the next one, which is data quality. While it might seem obvious, I mean, it just says what it is, right? Data quality. But it can often be a time-consuming and difficult process because you want to ensure that the data is accurate and that it's relevant for our use cases. There are different ways to verify the quality of the data depending on the data that we're working with. Storing and using data comes with many, many risks. For example, somebody might steal our data and use it for malicious purposes. And if we don't secure it properly, it could actually end up being our fault because it's our responsibility to protect it. So data security is really important, protecting data from unauthorized access. We want to implement encryption where necessary and only give the right people access to our data as well as any other measures we can take to keep our data secure. But it's not just about security. It is also about how we use the data because we don't need the data to get stolen or exposed for it to be problematic. If we use data in a wrong way, we could break data ethics. It's important to prioritize ethical behaviors in data analysis, ensuring that customer data is used responsibly, respecting privacy and consent. And there are also regulations nowadays that you have to consider. It is relevant, for example, when it comes to data visualizations and not fooling people using our data, but that's for another time. Now let's talk about data governance, which is about managing data availability, usability, integrity, and security. It is basically an overlying concept covering all of these things. Next, data is often coming from many different sources, and we may have to merge the data to combine it into one single place, both for efficiency, usability, and security. And this, by basically getting all the data into one place, is called data integration. Now, data warehousing is very central to this, which means storing data effectively, like in a warehouse, to kind of centralize business data for reporting and analysis. But the actual term, when we talk about the process to bring data from multiple sources into a new place, is called ETL, which stands for Extract, Transform, and Load. Basically, we extract data from the sources, we transform it into our structured format that we need, and then we load it into our warehouse. But sometimes we don't want to deal with the data and transform it and all that stuff, and we just want it into one big place where we can store a huge amount of data in its original form until we actually need it. Because it might not be worth spending resources processing all the data right away if we're not going to be using it. And that's why we have something called data lakes. 
An example is storing a lot of different data types from various sources in the cloud. Now let's talk about the fancy term machine learning and it's basically training computers and their algorithms to improve automatically through their own experience. And for example, the computer might be able to predict future purchases in a store at a given day, depending on previous purchasing behaviors at the store. There are different types of machine learning and one of these forms work with label data, which is like using historical sales to predict future sales. And this is called supervised learning. I'm also dropping some free data scientist and data analyst roadmaps in the description, which you can check out. And also make sure to drop a like and subscribe to the channel and we'll meet again in a future video. But now let's continue. Number 19. Now we also have the other aspects, which is machine learning from unlabeled data to find patterns. An example could be segmenting our audience based on purchasing behavior. Even if we never define categories, then we can let the machine do it for us. This is called unsupervised learning. All right, so that was a lot of stuff, but we have just a few machine learning concepts left. The next one is about categorizing data into predefined classes. For example, if you have an email system like Gmail, it can automatically tag certain emails as spam and others as priority or even warn you about potential viruses. Whatever it is, it is a form of classification and it's something that you can train machines to do for you. Another important concept is regression or regression analysis, which is about estimating relationships between a dependent variable and one or more independent variables. One way to explain this is kind of, for example, in forecasting house prices based on different things like size, location, and just what's going on in the economy and in the country overall. Now, what about when we have many different data points that are similar? Can we group them together? Well, of course we can. We can actually segment customers into groups based on their shopping habits. Some customers might buy every single week, whereas others buy every, you know, once a year. And we may want to focus our marketing spend on certain types of customers. The process where we group similar data points is called clustering. Now, let's talk about dimensionality reduction. It basically means that we try to reduce the number of variables in the data using different techniques to simplify large data sets. There are a variety of reasons why we do this and different ways to do this as well. And you can look into it further if you're interested because we still have a lot of concepts to go. Now, what is feature engineering? Well, when we create machine learning models, we create predictors. Like for instance, we may want to create new variables from existing data, like the age of a building from its construction data. And perhaps the most important thing is selecting the right model, for example, for data analysis, like between linear regression and decision trees for a prediction task. Now, number 26 is going to be cross validation. And when we have different predictive models, we can evaluate these models by partitioning the original sample into a training set that we can use to train the model, and then a test set as well that we can use to evaluate it. And this is called cross validation. All right, now when we try to optimize the parameters of a machine learning algorithm, we go through something called hyperparameter tuning. It could be about adjusting the number of layers A in a neural network for better performance. Now let's talk about neural networks. They're basically a set of algorithms supposed to model and work like the human brain. It's used for recognizing patterns and to train machines to do so, like recognizing people on an image by just looking at the image. But there are a ton of other terms as well, and they can end up being a little bit confusing. So if we have a subset of machine learning that involves neural networks with many different layers, we call this deep learning. It is often used for complex tasks like translation. We also have a specific type of neural network that we can use for analyzing visuals, like automatic photo tagging in the system we mentioned before. These are called convolutional neural networks. Another form of neural networks are suitable for processing sequential data. This can be text as an example for NLP tasks, and these are called recurrent neural networks or RNNs. But what about NLP tasks? Well, NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. It's basically about the computer and its ability to understand human language as it is spoken and written. That is why it's called a natural language. It refers to R, the human language. Now, we have different languages like English and French, but for the computer, they're all a part of the human language because computers actually have their own language and they operate in zeros and ones. So for the computer, our languages are kind of like different programming languages for us. Now, we don't just want our model to learn something, we actually want to make it really useful. Therefore, there are different ways to apply the knowledge we gain by solving one problem to a different problem that's related. And this is where it gets really interesting because 
we don't need to show the computer the exact problem beforehand. It can actually use a similar problem and solve the next problem by itself, the first time. In the real world, we could pre-train it on image recognition and then use it to identify specific objects in satellite images, for example. And this concept is called transfer learning because it basically transfers its learning to a new problem. Now, another form of learning is when we combine multiple machine learning algorithms to improve the performance of our algorithms. For example, if we have a classification task, we can use different types of algorithms and we don't just need one. This is called ensemble learning. Now, number 35, and next up we have random forests. This is also an ensemble learning method useful for classification and regression, like predicting a loan default risk based on our existing customer data. Now, we can use SVM or support vector machines for classification or regression, like to classify emails into spam and non-spam categories. Then we have gradient boosting, and this is a technique for regression and classification problems, such as improving the accuracy of a prediction model. Next, we have PCA or principal component analysis. This is a technique that's used to emphasize variation and capture strong patterns in a dataset. We also have methods for cluster analysis in data mining, and one of these are called k-means clustering. It can, for example, be about segmenting retail customers based on their purchase history. And this brings us to KNN or k nearest neighbors. This is a non-parametric method used for classification and regression, like when Netflix recommends you movies based on similarity to previous watched movies, which can be very helpful. Now there's quite a bit of math and statistics in data science, and one of these concepts are about applying Bayes' theorem with prior knowledge to study different parameters. This is called Bayesian analysis, and an example would be with predictive modeling, like updating the probability of having a disease based on test results. Now, if you're a beginner, you're probably not familiar with all of these concepts, and that's completely fine. But the next one, I think you might get it. Now, we also have something called sentiment analysis, and it's all about classifying the emotional tone behind a series of words, which we can use to better understand attitudes, opinions, and emotions. It gives us a more complex picture rather than just relying on the words being said. Now let's move fast for the last few ones. Anomaly detection is about identifying unusual patterns that don't conform to our expected behaviors, basically identifying something strange. It could be detecting unusual or fraudulent transactions on a bank account. Now we can find associations and relationships among large sets of data items, and this is called association rules. Collaborative filtering is all about predicting users' interests based on the interests of other users, just like with a recommendation system for Netflix, but here we focus on what other similar users enjoyed. Time series analysis is all about analyzing data points collected over time. For example, we can collect or predict different stock market trends in the future based on historical price data. F47 and predictive modeling is very useful, for example, to use past data to predict future sales. We create test and validate a model to best predict the outcome. Data pipelining is the process of moving data from one place to another, often through a process called ETL, extract, transform, and load. Data analytics is kind of like a subfield of data science where we more focus on using data to improve business decision and decision making overall. And finally, data science is the study of data to extract meaningful insights for businesses using all sorts of methods. Of course, that is incredibly simplified, but thanks for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Subscribe for more videos like this. And also check out this one on the screen. I do think that you would enjoy this video as well as it's kind of tailored for you now.